Hello, my name is Sarah Stolker, and I'm a physical therapist and certified lymphedema specialist in St. Louis, Missouri, and I'd like to thank you for joining me today to talk about what early detection means to you. So today I'm going to be talking specifically about cancer treatment-related lymphedema. So. Um, we're talking about a form of secondary lymphedema, which is a lymphedema with no, I'm sorry, with a specific cause. And those causes really lie in the treatment of cancer, specifically surgery and radiation. We'll talk about breast cancer, melanoma, cervical, endometrial, and vulvar cancer, so gynecolog gynecological cancer treatment, head and neck, prostate cancers, and sarcomas, and how the treatment of these can um, result in lymphedema. So the incidence of lymphedema is really related to the treatment type, and um, we see this broken down by type of cancer and treatment, specifically for breast cancer and some of those other cancers that I mentioned. As we get more complex in the treatment of the cancer, for example, a more invasive surgery or including radiation or whole field radiation, then what we experience is an increase in the incidence of lymphedema, what we see. So specifically for breast cancer, we see that the axillary lymph node dissection for breast cancer has an incidence rate of 22.3% in women, um, and then that actually jumps up to 31.5 for patients who've had breast radiation. So um, we also see the incidence numbers lined out for the gynecological cancers, and they're fairly high at 30 to 40%, and then even higher with melanoma treatment. So what are the risk factors for lymphedema? Um, some of these we can control and some of these we can't. So how do you know which ones you have and whether or not that increases your own risk of developing lymphedema? Some things, as I mentioned, you can't control. The tumor stage, the size, um, the treatment characteristics and outcomes, for example, how many nodes you had removed, whether or not they were positive, whether or not you developed an infection during the healing process postoperatively. Those are things you can't control, but they do have a bearing on your risk for lymphedema. Other things that are interesting and, and a little bit more in our control are things like occupation and hand use. So we can see that um, people who have a high use um, of their hand in their job or in their lifestyle may be more inclined to develop lymphedema. But we also see that people who don't use their arm at all or leg that is at risk can be also susceptible to developing lymphedema. So um, in addition, there are certain body characteristics that predispose people to developing lymphedema. For example, um, obesity, a body mass index, which is a relationship between your height and weight. If you have a body mass index of greater than 30, you are at a higher risk for developing lymphedema. Hand dominance can play a role so that Really, this goes back to the hand use. If you have a non-dominant limb that is at risk, then you can afford to not use it. And as a result, um, you could be at higher risk for developing lymphedema. So we would expect to see a lower incidence for a dominant limb than for a non-dominant limb. Also, just your compliance with risk reduction behaviors, for example, um, the things that we would recommend that would help you reduce your risk are certain behaviors that would help you to avoid fluid collection in that specific limb. As I already mentioned, body weight is a factor and maintaining a healthy body weight will help to reduce your risk of lymphedema. That continues to come up in the research and is actually very important for you to take home from this. Um, exercise, getting regular exercise, and taking really good care of your skin. Those end up being the three most important things that you can do to reduce your risk of developing lymphedema. Other things like um, avoiding constrictive clothing or a heavy purse um, is important because it, those things can trap fluid and make it harder for your lymphatic system to remove fluid from a specific area. Excessive heat and cold exposure is thought to cause uh, fluid trapping, I mean, I mean increased, is thought to cause increased uh, blood flow to a specific area, which can then place a burden on your lymphatic system. And then finally, stasis. So that means that if you're not using your limb, the blood can pool and um, create an excess burden on your lymphatic system. 
Other risk reduction behaviors really just include being aware of not overdoing it, not um, participating in excessive activity like deciding to paint a room in a day or um, helping a friend move, something like that, where your body is just not used to doing that activity and it really puts a tax on not only um, your muscular system but also uh, on your lymphatic system. And then also air travel. Air travel can be problematic because the air pressure um, in the airplane does drop when you go up, the atmospheric pressure drops. And so just being aware of um, not only that, but some of the other assaults that travel can do on the lymphatic system, just so that you can, can minimize those as much as possible. So how do you minimize your risk of developing lymphedema? There is much more information available through the National Lymphedema Network. There's a do's and don'ts uh, page. There are position papers, which are um, documents that have put, been put together by experts. And what they can do is really um, outline the best practice for you. So what are the tools for detecting lymphedema? Um, we predominantly use the tape measure um, in the clinic traditionally. And by, basically that's because um, it's the cheapest, easiest way, and especially um, for people who are just learning. But um, there's a real challenge with that because there's a lot of variance between therapists. It can be time consuming. And that can be frustrating for a patient just that if the measurements by one therapist don't really match with the measurements by another therapist. Water displacement is another tool. It's not necessarily used very often. It can be sometimes messy. It, it involves submerging a limb into, um, into a, um, a bit of water and then the water that is displaced is the volume of the limb. I predominantly use this for hand measurements just because it can be pretty messy to put an entire lower extremity into a container of water. Taking a weight measurement is important because sometimes it can take a while between um, uh, measurements. Screening measurements are sometimes separated by several months. And so weight is a great thing to have in addition to some other measurement tools, but it's very nonspecific to lymphedema. So it's, it's not, not enough. Our current methods still involve the tape measure in assistance with the um, volume calculation software where we're able to put those tape measure measurements into a software program to generate a volume for your limb. But also something called bioimpedance. So bioimpedance spectroscopy or BIS is a new tool that measures the rate of electric current flow in the limbs to determine whether or not there are variations in fluid between those limbs. So this electric current travels faster through more water. So if your limb has more water or fluid, then the current travels faster and the tool will detect this. So how does this work? Basically, this technology uses a low frequency so that the signal can travel between the cells, as you see on the diagram. And that's important because this is where lymphedema develops, is between the cells in what we call the extracellular space. And um, the current passes right through there, so it's very specific to lymphedema. The tool is measuring the body's impedance to the flow, so how many barriers it runs into as it goes through. And if there's fluid, then the current doesn't experience much barrier and it travels faster. So this is a harmless, painless, very rapid test. Um, patients are often surprised that it's over by the time um, I'm finished. So how do we interpret these results? Well, obviously this is going to be the therapist's job, but um, you will see uh, something like this um, on a printout that comes from the software associated with this uh, tool. And it's actually really easy to interpret. So the measurements are taken from the device and put into a ratio, which gives you a result in, in the form of a whole number, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, kind of number. And um, basically this ratio is compared to a database so that it can tell you whether it's in the normal range, which as you see here is in green. And um, if the measurement is outside that normal range, then it deserves further investigation. So ideally, um, we would wanna have pre-surgical measurements specific to you so that we could help make this tool even more sensitive. Um, if we have a pre-surgical baseline, then we don't worry quite so much about being in that green zone versus the pink zone. Uh, we worry more about what the shift has been from one measurement to the next measurement. 
So today's tools for early detection, we compare the tape measure with bioimpedance. Um, it's really a very interesting comparison because although the tape measure is inexpensive and mobile, bioimpedance is pretty low cost and covered in most Medicare areas anyway. The tape measure can be potentially variable um, uh, and minimal tape training is required, but it can be fairly time consuming. This diagram has someone measuring every 10 centimeters, although we typically measure every four centimeters. So that's quite a lot of measurements, especially on a lower extremity. With bioimpedance, it's a very fast result. It's highly reproducible, and um, we're able to immediately compare all the test results for a, speci a specific patient. And as I mentioned before, because we're, we're tra that, that, that current is traveling through the extracellular space, it's very specific to lymphedema. So why do we screen for lymphedema? Lymphedema can be obviously uh, an unexpected side effect in a lot of situations, unfortunately, and it can be referred to um, by physicians sometimes as benign, meaning not harmful. But in reality, we know that lymphedema can cause an increased infection risk. It can cause functional limitations due to heaviness and therefore disuse of the limb. It may not feel good to use it and therefore you just don't use it. Um, self-image problems, which can lead to social, social isolation, complications with employment, with relationships, and definitely a visible reminder of cancer. So how do we, do, why would we screen patients for lymphedema? Well, there are so many reasons and they're really well outlined with this perspective surveillance model. So this is kind of a framework that's been provided on how we go about changing from our traditional approach to lymphedema screening to something called the prospective surveillance model or PSM model. So traditionally, we would advise patients to contact the medical team if any problems arise and make sure that we educate them on the signs of symptoms of lymphedema, but that may occur at the preoperative or postoperative period when a lot of other things are going on and that message might not reach home. So patients often feel unsure and alone in monitoring themselves. They're not sure what they're looking for. So with the PSM, we're routinely evaluating patients for common side effects. We've got baselines on those patients so that we can detect them that much better. Um, we're reinforcing education at regular intervals so that if there are any questions or areas that are not clear, we can clarify those. And then patients are experiencing decreased anxiety if they're, if they're feeling like they're adequately monitor, monitored. So with the PSM, this was introduced in cancer in 2012, it provides a framework for us to how do we, how do we assess patients from diagnosis all the way through survivorship. How do we promote early identification of symptoms and intervene for physical impairment? So if you're developing something, we wanna be able to identify it early and intervene before it becomes a problem for you. Essentially, we want to look for the things that we know could develop, um, either while they're developing or shortly thereafter. So it also provides a much better edu education opportunity. Um, I'm gonna switch gears here for a minute and just talk about the treatment for lymphedema. Traditionally, um, with a traditional diagnosis, we're seeing someone after they develop lymphedema in therapy. So um, the patient is, is doing that diagnosis of lymphedema on their own at home. And that can be sometimes frustrating because we're not, people are not sure what is this lymphedema, is this not? And that can be sometimes difficult to determine. So once they are referred to therapy, we're able to initiate complete decongestive therapy, which is a daily massage, bandaging and exercise along with skincare uh, for two to three weeks and then a compression garment fitting. It's an intensive program, but it's highly effective in reducing swelling. So if we compare that with early diagnosis, um, hopefully under the PSM model and with an early screening situation, we can um, establish the relationship between you and the therapist already. And so the diagnosis may occur either at a screening visit or um, um, when you're with a therapist because the symptoms are probably not visible at that point or they probably haven't become problematic for you. So um, the solution can be presented immediately. There's a lot less of, oh my gosh, what am I going to do? How, how am I going to handle this? Is it treatable? Um, that kind of thing. And then compression garments can be ordered uh, versus the full therapy complement, and I'll explain that in just a minute. Thanks to a study by Nicole Stout, um, we were able to um, 
we were able to look at some great data that was published in 2008 in the Journal of Cancer. And basically this study looked at 196 breast patients at the Naval Medical Center, and they were screened at regular intervals, so pre-op and several times post-op. Um, and they were looking for what we would consider pre-lymphedema or subclinical lymphedema, meaning you probably don't see it, but we can detect it with either with the bioimpedance um, or with symptomology followed by bioimpedance. So specifically, they define that as a 3% change in the limb volume. And when they detected that, and they detected it in 43 out of 196 women, they prescribed a course of compression therapy for four weeks. So patients were put into a compression sleeve for four, four weeks and, um, and then reassessed. And the results of this were 100% reversal back to baseline. So patients were able to um, achieve a normal volumetric result. So with early detection, as I just mentioned, if we identify lymphedema in the early phase, it often requires much less treatment, for example, compression sleeve versus intensive therapy, and the lymphedema is much more likely to be reversible, meaning that it, we, can, we can reverse the situation and get you back into a normal uh, physiology and the overall health co healthcare cost will be reduced. So I am a big proponent of education, you probably noticed that by now, and I really find that this allows a lot of early education versus that late education that our traditional model um, facilitated. So early education means that we give you pre-approved safe initial resources. So we can um, give you the right resources and connect you to the right websites. Um, we can caution you about controversial topics like, hey, you might hear about air travel and you might hear about hot tubs or, or whatever, and, and you can be ready for um, some of those controversial topics without them really derailing your confidence about how you're going to handle uh, lymphedema should it develop. The health, so the healthcare provider is the source of information, and that really establishes trust of the relationship, and um, it can really curtail some of the psychological effects of lymphedema. Unfortunately, with late education, what I see um, with some of my patients is that, you know, by the time I see them, they've had unlimited and unvetted sources of information, which may or may not be true. Um, they've been vulnerable to controversial topics, and that leads them to really second guess um, what they should do, how they should approach um, lymphedema, should it develop, or if it, if it is developing at that point. So they can be angry, and um, angry about omitted treatment or omitted surveillance. There is some distrust that develops between the patient and the healthcare providers, and the patient, unfortunately, can sometimes just blame, them, blame themselves. So I just want to um, kind of summarize for you really um, what this, um, what my presentation really focuses on is how there is an ongoing shift towards early detection of lymphedema. And those factors really include that we have better tools, um, bioimpedance really affords this opportunity, and we have better guidelines like the PSM, the Prospective Surveillance Model. So, um, so we're, we, we can detect it better, and uh, we have the framework to detect it better. Um, and it also affords us better education for our patients to improve outcomes, to improve quality of life for those involved. So I wanna just leave you with some resources. Um, I would highly recommend that you go to the National Lymphedema's National Lymphedema Network's website, which is listed here, and download a position paper on risk reduction. Um, if you're looking for a bioimpedance um, equipped therapist near you, I would recommend contacting Impedimed, and here is the website available for you. And I would like to thank the Lymphatic Education and Research Network for inviting me to speak today, and. Um, I'm really glad to be here, so thank you so much.